Good plan. So, Saturday, which day? Which day? And then we can figure out if we're still energetic for Sunday. <laughs> I think, Ron, so what's the weather? Is there thunderstorms threatened? But usually these rainstorms are brief. So okay. Great uh, rain code. Yeah, as long as you're not a vibe, I like it. Okay. Thanks, Brad. So welcome back. And I promise you, I will show you a cotyledal maps. So here it is with the amphidromic points, uh, those small spiders in white. So in colors, you see the amplitude of the tides. So it corresponds to the movie you saw uh, in the first lecture. And uh, so along the line, a high tide and low tide uh, takes place uh, at the same time. And uh, so at those points, uh, there should be no tide. And this is what happened with the blue color. And so uh, that was uh, one uh, striking example of breaking time reversal symmetry on a given wave mode. And uh, I told you at the end that uh, probably the, uh, un so another uh, consequence of breaking time reversal symmetry is the presence of unidirectional mode uh, in the dispersion relation uh, for the spectrum of the wave uh, operator. And I think the first example in physics of uh, a such unidirectional mode that are trapped uh, came uh, with the computation of uh, coastal waves by uh, Kelvin. So uh, this will be the aim of this lecture to, to present those waves and uh, their topological origin. Yes. I, I had a question about like, is, is this uh, analogous to uh, an infinite term for a like Acoustic? Yeah. Acoustics. Yeah. I would say it's different. This phase singularity caustics would be a singularity of amplitude. So there are singularity of the phase. This is an example, singularity of the amplitude that would be of the caustic when the rays converge. Yeah. And uh, there are other, other, actually it's interesting because there is a, a third kind of instability that would be uh, the wave bond touching point, conical instability, uh, conical uh, singularity. For those waves, uh, there are those three kinds of uh, singularities. That's a good point. And so before um, uh, uh, presenting coastal wave, uh, I would like to make a, sh a short parenthesis on the uh, Rossby wave. So I spoke about Rossby wave very rapidly when we uh, show the Matsuno spectrum. So I would like to make a short connection with mid latitude Rossby wave that you heard about uh, last week. So let's take again a, a planet rotating. And uh, in the texture, we consider the model, the shallow water model. Let's consider an even, even simpler model, the Euler equation on the sphere. And uh, so the Euler equation, we read like this, we'll have a, a relative uh, vorticity. Uh, plus uh, planetary vorticity should be uh, F, the curliest parameter. So remember, so if I draw F, it's change between two omega and minus two omega. And then dynamics, will be given by this two-dimensional Euler equation with relative vorticity, planetary vorticity. And so the velocity is written in terms of a stream function. We consider an incompressible flow. And the relative vorticity is the Laplacian of the stream function. Okay, so this quantity that is vectored is called potential, is the sim simple version of potential vorticity. And uh, so by writing this that way, I assume that uh, I, we take a tangent plane here, okay, with the y direction going north, northward, x direction going uh, eastward. 
And uh, I just want to stress something is that uh, the Earth is strat along the Earth, we can see uh, the Earth as a stratified medium in a Coralis parameter. If I draw the isoline like this, it's a kind of stratification, the stratification of this parameter that varies from two omega to minus two omega. And uh, it's uh, interesting to, to see in this model what happens for the F plane and for the beta plane approximation. Remember F plane, we said F is constant. Okay, F is constant. This term disappears, this term disappears because of the derivative. So it's interesting because on the F plane, you forget about the rotation. You don't know about the rotation. There is not just within this model, there is just the relative vorticity. So even if you are on the F plane, in this model, you're invariant with respect to time reversal symmetry. Okay. And then you can go to next order, make the beta plane approximation. And then it's also interesting because wherever you are on the sphere, uh, you will end up with a This equation. Here are beta is the gradient of the Curly's parameter. And uh, now let's look at the equation lin linearized around a, a state of rest. So the dynamic will be dt zeta plus beta v equals zero, not. So this is v. And so if you look at solution, uh, so you have an equation with a homogeneous coefficient. You look at the equation and wave solution, and you get the dispersion relation of those B waves. Let's draw the relation like this. That for different value of L, and uh, here is K, here is omega. So beta breaks time reversal symmetry in this model. One manifestation uh, is uh, those waves, because if you make omega minus omega, it's broken. Um, so L is for these waves, given value of L. And uh, so let's just give us simple interpretation for those waves. So you have a line here of a constant uh, potential vorticity, the sum of those two terms. And uh, let's perturb this line. So I take fluid particles from this line and I put them on this uh, purple line. So I take a fluid particle here. I go to the north here, I go to the south. But if I go to the north, this term is larger. So this quantity is conserved. So relative vorticity must decrease. So uh, there will be a kind of, uh, which color should we use? A vortex like this. The opposite happens for this particle. There will be a vortex like that. And if you look at the consequence uh, of the small vortex on the purple line, it will uh, drift like this. So at the end, what you get is a wave that is the crest that uh, travel uh, westward. So this is the phase speed, omega over k, which is always negative. So those are the words the wave. And uh, two remarks. Uh, first remarks is uh, that within this model, those are plane wave solution. This is relevant to uh, describe mid latitude uh, dynamics. But as soon as we take the shallow water model, those uh, wave mode become trapped at the equator because you know about the equator. Uh, F, the F value of F naught is important for the shallow water model. And uh, uh, so it was one remark. And a, a second remark is just to make a, a connection with the lecture of KISS uh, in the credit card uh, limit uh, regime. Uh, so, because we started with the shallow water model, Within this model, for Kelvin waves, we had uh, three three wave bands. So remember, this is omega, k, l, and we had this parameter here, 
f. And actually, so this is the wave for the shallow water model. Uh, but at, at low order, low, lowest order, the geostrophic balance corresponds to this, uh, this wave band. And then we can plug in nonlinearity, introduce the small parameter, the ROSB, uh, the typical velocity, L, typical length scale, F curly parameter. You make this parameter that goes to zero, but this case, and then you filter out those waves. There remains only the central band. And uh, this amount to take a large gap limit yeah, between uh, those waves. And again, in terms of symmetry, it's interesting because by filtering out those waves, so you simplify your model. In the ERTO model, you have a, a complex one, the shallow water, a simpler one where you remove some, of the, some part of the dynamics. You keep only one wave bound, but you look at the nonlinear interaction between those modes here. And this bond was topologically trivial, remember. And a signature of this uh, feature is recovered here in this model, which is up to an additional term that is not important. Uh, recovered from this wave band. So shallow water goes to quasi geostrophic model by this parameter goes to zero. This parameter is the symmetry breaking parameter. And in asymptotic expansion, as is always the, as stressed by a, a case, uh, the system we get when we done the expansion doesn't feature the parameter we used. Uh, and because it was the symmetry breaking parameter, we recover the symmetry. And we add back the effect of flotation through the beta effect, and then back again. But because there is only a single wave mode, we cannot expect for these quasi or Euler kind of model topological feature, because remember what was key is to have different wave bands. So this is the other point. I really want to stress this. If you want to see a new model, wave model topological feature, you need to have wave bands. So a model with several fields involved. So one thing, and another thing I want to stress that will be very important for today is that you need several wave bands and you need to have somewhere in your parameter uh, space, uh, different three, you, you need to have three parameters at end. And let me just shift a bit the axis for today. Uh, should I do it now? Okay, let's do it that way. Uh, I take uh, F here, uh, L, E, and K here. The only, so this is the same thing as the, the lecture before, where the degeneracy point, the other kind of singularity I was talking about. And I draw the parameter space that way, because I also want to stress another thing, that the fact that there were a spectral flow wave that transit from one wave band to another required a parameter, a spectral flow parameter. That was K. Yeah, this could be something else. That was, this, that was the wave number in X direction because we took advantage of invariance in X direction. But I could have another parameter if my model, so in your flow model, if you want to look for topological wave, you can take advantage of something else that the wave number. It could be some external parameter that you are able to vary. But then what is very, very important is that I have this parameter F, which remember, I put quote because here is a parameter, but from the original wave, problem, it was a function of y. Okay, so you get something like y here and the conjugate coordinate, conjugate the momentum as I said. And so this is a kind of phase space. And you get a phase space with y and the wave number here and an external parameter that varies. And when you change the external parameters, properties of the dynamics in the phase space will change. I stress this now, just keep this in mind. Maybe I will have the time to go back to this at the end. Yes? Uh, when you're talking about the volume waves, they move westward, but I, I was wondering if there would be equal to us, and I just look at that uh, omega k plot, there's a change in the environment, and then velocity is always westward. The phase velocity is always westward. The group velocity change sign. And that's why I said, uh, when I presented the Matsuno spectrum, that you could draw a line at sufficiently low frequency when there are only Rossby waves, the Yanai waves, and the, the Kelvin waves. And uh, what is topological is the difference of uh, the number of modes that go, uh, let me get right, they go eastward minus the number of modes that, that go westward. 
And so when you do this for those B waves, take a line of constant frequency, you will always cross twice the dispersion uh, branch. And then one in is one far, the other is far, the net number is zero. So they, they do not contribute to this. Yeah, yes, yeah, I was with, uh, I said to the, the crest, the, the, the crest, yes. I was not speaking about the energy, but uh, it's important to, to stress this. So let's go for a second lecture and let's go on board with uh, Kelvin. Apparently he had a boat, it's a picture. And um, so he was the, so when I said that, uh, uh, Kelvin problem is the tangent plane infinite in a, a unbounded plane. It, it was wrong actually, because in the paper, he considered a channel it was motivated by tides and we have continents. Uh, and uh, so he, he made a computation in a channel with, a, with a two boundaries. this and at those boundaries it took impermeability condition no normal flow condition where you impose p equal zero yeah and he did the computation so before uh, uh, presenting the, the waves let's look at an experiment so from uh, sakai i think in japan and uh, so this is a turntable this is a little bit smaller than one meter here. There is a wave generator. The first case is uh, non-rotating. So you will see the waves uh, emitted here and reflected bouncing back on, on the wall. And it will occupy the bulk of the domain. So in that sense, it's a bulk wave in the, in the interior. And then uh, same, fre same uh, frequency, but with rotation. So the table is rotating. We look from above. Yes, yes. Uh, so we look from above, and um, uh, what we look at actually it's a two-layer fluid. So it's just like you what you would see for surface waves, except that uh, for surface waves, uh, you take the square root of uh, g h to have the velocity, and it's very large. You start to see it experimentally, and also there is a typical uh, length scale which is this uh, velocity minus the rotation, and you want to see the trapping. So you want this velocity to be small. And one way to have a smaller phase velocity with the same model is consider a, a two-layer flow with uh, rho plus delta rho. It's homogeneous here, rho here. And you consider the dynamic of this layer. And here, the dynamics is the same as the shallow one model I presented before. The only difference is that change g into a radius gravity. So the phase, because uh, you gain a factor 100 or 1000 with this uh, factor here, you get much lower phase speed. And actually this interpretation of uh, the shallow water model is the one that allows you to describe the heat anomaly I present you uh, in the first movie for El Nino in the ocean. If you took the value uh, square root of GH for the ocean, it'd be a very fast wave. Uh, it is a slow wave because it describes the dynamics above in the upper surface of the ocean, few hundred meters. So here it's a very clever way uh, of uh, uh, observing the waves because what we see is the interface, the inner interface here. And for this, there is light that go from below and they use a polarized uh, uh, fluid that uh, that's such that uh, the color is different when it's dips or shallow. So it's a clever experiment. It's, it's well described in this uh, website. I recommend it to you because there are those experiments, but also uh, other experiments of geophysical fluid dynamics that are very, um, very interesting. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. There is a one wave trapped here and one wave trapped here. 
And so this makes, and this one is trapped there. This one is trapped there. And okay, I come back to this, but the, the, it's no, it's a good uh, point. The length scale, the tracking length scale here is called the Rosby radius of deformation. It's the only length scale you can make with your problem parameter is C over F. C is square root of J. And if the coalesce parameter, which is supposed to be constant. So from now on, we, we stay on the plane here. F constant, uh, sorry. Stay on the plane here. F constant. No, this way. Anyway, F, F is, is constant. Small lake. No, 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 no. Yes. It's a planetary scale uh, or lake, if you, if you wish. Uh, typically, the scale, the Rosby radius, uh, typical scale for the ocean will be from 10 to 100 kilometers. Uh, and uh, in the atmosphere, it's more about uh, 1,000 kilometers. Yes? Yeah, uh, question. If it's a coastline, so wave and uh, it, and it specifically, specifically the wavelength of the wavy coastline equals to the waves, the Kelvin waves wavelength, is it possible to get some measurements from the action? Uh, they are very interesting uh, resonance phenomena either between the waves or between uh, uh, the waves and uh, the bottom topography. Uh, indeed, yes. Uh, with the shape of the coast, uh, it could be, yes. Like, uh, yes, if you send, uh, it's a wide dimensional wave problem when you send the waves and you have uh, uh, mm, Yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, yes, it, uh, you could you 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 can have a, a resonance phenomena between uh, a coastal uh, Kelvin waves and the bottom topography. I was just uh, thinking about the coast itself. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, maybe you could imagine an experiment where you have a flat coast and uh, rugged coast, and you see the the transmission of uh, the waves uh, around it. But I'm not sure about the result. That's what uh, I'm hesitating. Uh, so here is the movie. So you have to think of the frequency, frequen the forcing frequency here as uh, within the gap between the geosophic wave band and the inertia Poincare wave band. And uh, within the gap, the only wave you can excite uh, uh, is the coastal Kelvin wave and the trapping length scale here. So this is the velocity, square root of GH. It's a reduced gravity, it should be G prime. And the trapping length scale is C, the gravity, non rotating gravity, phase speed over F, the two times the period of the table. So, the, just to say that those waves, you, you see them on experiment and it's known for a long time. Uh, okay. How is it really just the actual rotation? So, uh, it's go out of the black band. So, it's a rotating table here. It's turning like this, and we look from above. So same direction as gravity. Now it's not tilted. Interesting phenomena can happen when it's tilted. Uh, but Why is it square? Ah, uh, uh, it's a square, uh, square box, yes. It's the container is a square like this uh, on the table uh, with a, uh, yeah. Okay, you start. Uh, so it's, it, it does not, you start the to, to put the generator not uh, from a state of rest first to rotate your experiment. So there is a, a spin up. Then uh, in the state of, uh, in the rotating frame of reference, you are at rest. So the fluid is not spinning, you are at rest, and then you excite the wave. So there is no vortex in the, the Yes, there, yes, exactly. There is centrifugal, centrifugal force that, in, uh, uh, that uh, induces this parabolic shape, which is uh, small uh, in that case. But when you uh, turn fast, actually it can be large and it is a way to mimic the beta effect. Uh, 
but uh, here, it, let's say it's small. And uh, the dynamics we see is not a vortex, but really just a, a wave, surface wave. Sorry? Uh, I don't know. Uh, check uh, in the, typically, uh, I would say the rotation is less, uh, is between uh, uh, 10 seconds uh, for a turn to one minute, but- uh, Five seconds. Five seconds? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I was wrong by five. <laughs> and uh, if you run too fast, you had really a strong parabola. Okay, so let's uh, let's uh, start with uh, the the Kelvin computation, but an even simpler case where uh, that's something you can check easily. Uh, we take a semi-infinite plane, so this is y. This is uh, x, and uh, let's write again uh, the equation. This time with dimension it will be useful. For the next part. Uh, and I keep h. Okay. Let's write it that way. So remember, H is the fluid, uh, the fluid depth. So Z equals X Y, and uh, is the interface. And uh, what did Kelvin is, is uh, first uh, uh, the bulk uh, computation. So you have to do the uh, sum of uh, exponential uh, uh, of plane wave that you combine such that uh, you are uh, satisfy the boundary condition V equals zero here. So for the spectrum, this gives you, this is K, this is omega, and this gives you Isolation, I project of the value of L. L from zero to infinity. So those are the bulk solution. Those are waves like this. And actually it's one wave going upward plus one wave going downward that makes a given mode here. Okay, it's the same computation as in the infinite plane plus the constraint to cancel V. Should check this. And uh, the point I want to stress is that there is an additional wave that you find just by assuming V equals zero everywhere. Okay, you do this, you find geostrophic balance in the meridional direction as in the equatorial case. And you work a bit and uh, you find this, this, this this wave branch. And uh, the important point is that this describes a, a wave that is trapped with the trapping length scale, which is given by C over F. So check this, it's not difficult and uh, it's instructive to do it, to see why the other waves is not possible. So this is an unidirectional mode. This is a trap mode. It looks like the equatorial Kevin wave that was topological. So we would like to say it's a topological mode, but it's it's uh, it's not easy like this. Why? Because I told you you need three parameters, and here we just get two parameters because f is prescribed. Is prescribed now. We cannot vary this parameter. It's given we are in the northern hemisphere or in the southern hemisphere. We have just two parameters k and l. So what can we do? So perhaps we could say, oh, we have two parameters, but it's a plane. Uh, we can uh, transform this plane into a sphere. But uh, for this, we will need to check that in infinity can be uh, brought to a single point. And in that particular, in some cases, it's possible. Here, it's not possible. 
remember we are looking for uh, three parameters to be able to unclose the degeneracy point. So one way of doing it is to, to think about what is the cost. So here in Kelvin problem, the cost is quite uh, sharp. So now it's why you have a wall like this. But why not uh, looking at a more general class of problem where now the cost is less sharp than a wall, something like this. So this is the coastal problem we will look at now. And the only difference with previous uh, case is that uh, H, the mean the depth will vary in the will vary in the y direction. So by this way we have a new parameter of the problem. Now in previous case F was varying. Now H is varying. So let's look at uh, this problem. And uh, let's start from uh, this set of equation above and write a vector, psi, a three component vector that will uh, be given by square root of h u, square root of h v, square root of g theta. And the dynamics can be recast uh, on this form. That looks, looks like a Schrodinger equation. From now on, I will put a hat here when it is an operator. So the two line means uh, it's a matrix, and this hat means that uh, the components of the matrix will be operators. And what is this operator? You should do this transformation. So be careful because H depends on Y. So it will be uh, y here, f dx uh, c dx minus f zero c dy c dx minus c dy, and this is very important, minus a parameter that I call beta t. Beta because it will play a role like beta for f, the gradient of f, t for topography because it will be a topographic beta. And uh, yes. Oh. Hey, no, that's the point. <laughs> that's a good uh, remark. And there is a two. Yeah. Two beta t. And so what is beta t? Is a. Uh, one fourth d y h h uh, probably c. So this is a uh, this parameter will be very important in the remaining. And uh, yes, it looks a bit uh, odd not to see this parameter here, but you can check that this operator is a self adjoint, is an Hermitian operator. So first, uh, with this scaling, actually, the norm of psi uh, uh, is uh, the energy, the total energy of the flow. So you integrate, uh, uh, you can integrate this quantity over space and uh, it's energy. And we say that we will say that it is equal to, to one. So this will allow us to have a normalized eigen mode. And you can check that for this norm, this operator is Hermitian. It will, it will have integ uh, integral by part, and uh, this term will play a role here. But it looks a bit strange because uh, then uh, for the, the equatorial wave problem, what I said very loosely, say, okay, we have a, a partial differential equation with spatially varying parameter. And the only spatially varying parameter was f. Yeah. Here we had the derivative, c was constant, and uh, there was not this term. Here it's a bit different because we have to be careful. c is spatially varying. 
Yeah. So what should I do? Should I uh, to define a bulk problem corresponding to this wave operator problem? Remember, we have a wave operator with, with a spatially varying coefficient. We are looking for information of the whole spectrum. And for this, we will transform this problem into a bulk problem and look for topological uh, properties in the bulk problem. So now what we are trying to do is to find a good bulk problem. So should I put L here? Uh, you could have, have many choice, many way of uh, choosing a, a bulk problem, but there is only one that guarantees that uh, an Hermitian operator will uh, be mapped to an Hermitian matrix for the bulk problem, uh, for which the bulk boundary correspondence that uh, I talked uh, in the previous lecture will work. So this is very, very, uh, it is a, a crucial point if you want to apply those techniques to your uh, wave problem. So the, the way to, to proceed is to use a wigner weil transform. Because the Wigner, wigner weil transform has exactly this property that relates an operator to, a, if it is a scalar operator, it will map the operator to a, a function and it allows you to make the transformation in both way from operator to function and to function to operator. So I, yes. So, sorry? Oh, yes, 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 thanks. So this is really the important concept of today's lecture. And uh, so historically, uh, those tools, uh, it, they come from semi-classical analysis when uh, a physicist uh, were, uh, wanted to map uh, classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. And in our case, it, it's a bit similar. We want to map a problem, uh, a wave operator problem, to compute the spectrum of these wave operator. That would be the equivalent of quantum mechanics. And uh, we want at the end to study the topological property uh, of a function or a matrix uh, where the elements are function. And this will be the equivalent of uh, classical mechanics. So this is a bit the reverse way that historically how it happened. But uh, so those tools were developed in this context of semi-classical analysis. And then it becomes a whole branch of mathematics uh, not always related to physics, but there are many important tools uh, that can be applied to physical system where you want to find information on the spectrum by looking at a simple problem like ray tracing. So it's interesting because usually you wave problem when you have an operator like Matsuno or whatever problem be difficult to, to solve. Uh, and you will map this to something that is called a symbol. So the operator will be, let's take the, the, the scalar operator or this operator, H, will be a function of Y, and you will see the derivative of Y, and you want to map it to a matrix, will be a function of Y and L. And uh, for quantum uh, mechanics, it would be the operator here, this would be the Hamiltonian. And you can typically do ray tracing. It's very easy and you can, ha you can have qualitative information of your system with ray tracing. For instance, Brad was talking about uh, caustics when uh, the rays converge. The caustics for ray tracing will have a signature on your spectrum. They correspond to an uh, infinite amplitude. Here you will have singularities, not with structure. So this goal well beyond topology. It's really worth uh, studying this, those transforms for uh, if you're interested into wave problems, from a, even from physics uh, point of view. And for topology, it is a, 
very useful. And so what is the, the Weld transform? So for a scalar, I want to uh, uh, find an operator. I should not call it F. So I, you give me a function uh, G of uh, Y and L. Should be the phase space function, the Hamiltonian. And I want to find the operator. Here it is a scalar. And the operator will define it on how it works on a test function, psi, and which is a function of y. And it will be dy prime dl exponential l y minus y prime g y plus y prime over 2 l psi y prime. So this is the definition of the Weil transform. So if you give me a function of two components, the spatial coordinate and the momentum, the wave number, uh, then with this formula, you can compute the for, the, an operator. Okay? And there is a reverse formula, the Wigner transform, that I do not need to write because actually, you, you can play uh, in simple case with integration by part, uh, Taylor expansion, and uh, to, uh, if you know the operator to find the symbol. So you can check it on very simple case that it does what you wanted to, to have. For instance, check that, uh, so let's look at the operator when there is a H and what happens to a function. So this is the operator, I just multiply psi by a function, the, the phase velocity, and the corresponding symbol will be the function. This is easy. And check this. With a, a prime here. Then uh, what is the, the symbol? Uh, so, sorry, what should it be? What is the operator associated with the symbol L? Again, you can check that it is minus i dy. Uh, so this is what we were looking for because this is what we did implicitly for, uh, in the first lecture when we replaced uh, dy by uh, L Matsuno's problem. But now in our uh, present problem, we, are, we have a more difficult situation where we multiply a derivative by a function of y. And, uh, so we can look at what happens to C Y times L. And in that case, we we'll find that it's C Y minus Y dy. Okay, this is expected from uh, the product, but Y and dy do not commute. And this is very important because of this known commutation. There is an additional term here. So I'm always wrong with the sign. So maybe check it, which is C prime over two. So C prime is the derivative of C. And you can continue uh, for polynomial relation with the exact expression like this. But for today, we only need this term. Like yes, it is the commutator. And uh, more generally, so here this is exact. Uh, for more general symbol, if it is non-polynomial, this will be only approximate, and the first order approximation will be the commutator, and so on and so forth. Operator, and uh, we look at what is the symbol, what is uh, the matrix to study. Uh, in relation with this operator. And because this uh, procedure maps for scalar operator self algen to real number and for uh, uh, matrix operator to uh, Hermitian uh, matrix, we sure that we can check that we get an Hermitian matrix. And you can make the transformation and you will find that H is YF. 
uh, I also I also take uh, in x direction is just the Fourier transform so minus y f here we will find the additional term c dy plus beta t ok minus c dy put i y minus beta t so now there are, now there is the symmetric term we lose the factor two and uh, but we add one here by applying uh, the formula there so remember c prime uh, will give is the derivative of c so it's related to beta c so now it's quite of interesting the structure because you see as for Matsuno problem, we had this term that break term reversal symmetry. And now we have those two terms here, but f is constant, and this term varies with y. So let's plot uh, this, uh, this term here. This is the y direction. My cost is here. This is uh, v. No. This is beta. So close to the cos, uh, h goes to zero. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Here it's considered as a, okay. Uh, here. Yeah, but uh, the dy come from uh, this, uh, oh, yes. okay, yes, you're right. <laughs> Sorry about this. You're right. Uh, y C N Y C N. Yeah, and there is no Y. Okay. Yes, thanks. And so beta T close to the cost, you have a one over H, let's say uh, the continental shelf, uh, the finite derivative. So it's infinity. And uh, okay, I consider the a complicated cost here. Let's take a simple one, exponential profile. And they, uh, this exponential profile for, for this particular case, there are exact results on the spectrum, like ball. So, up. Here is the shape of beta. It's, it's flat at infinity, so it's zero. It diverge here. So now we get something that varies uh, in the y direction. And uh, we want to study the property of uh, this matrix. And uh, something I want to point out about the symmetries is that uh, we saw last time there were uh, the Coriolis parameter breaking uh, time reversal symmetry or mirror symmetry in the y direction. Uh, and but the combination of both was preserved. Here, it's a bit different with this parameter. You can check, coming back to this original set of equations, this one is the same, that if you make the transformation T, X, Y, U, V, eta, F, beta T, so the time reversal symmetry will uh, be the transformation in minus T, x, y, minus u, minus v, eta, minus f, beta t. Beta does not break time reversal symmetry. But in the y direction, my, mirror symmetry, you will see that beta breaks u, minus v, eta, So it plays a, a different role than F. It, it breaks this symmetry as F does, but not this one. And this, this issue from condensed matter, this means, reminds you Haldane's model for uh, electrons in graphene. This is a, a toy model to describe uh, some, uh, that was historically uh, uh, derived uh, to understand in a simple case of phenomena happen, uh, happening uh, in a quantized Hall effect. 
And uh, a key point of this, I will not present the model, but a key point of this model was to emphasize the importance of breaking time reversal symmetry to obtain unidirectional trapped mode. And for this, he introduced two parameters, one time reversal symmetry uh, breaking parameter that here in our case will be F and another parameters that breaks your symmetry without breaking time reversal symmetry. And so let's look at the, the, the kind of phase diagram for the dispersion relation. So let's start to uh, forget about everything but the, the green line. So on the green line, beta topographic is zero and we vary F. This is uh, the first lecture. And look at what happens when F is zero and you vary beta. It's the same, it looks the same. You cannot say if uh, uh, you are in a rotating planet or in uh, an ocean with a varying uh, uh, bottom topography. And that was a, a key point emphasized by Aldane in the model for electrons, is that if you look only at, at the dispersion relation, you cannot make the difference between uh, the, uh, a problem that is uh, where time reversal um, uh, symmetry is broken and one with mirror symmetry is broken. If you look at the eigenmod, you will find it. And then what is interesting now is to see what happens when both are non zero. And so let's look at the generic case. So this one. Uh, where here beta is larger than f, you see that the degeneracy of the flat band has been lifted. It's still the belt problem, but it looks like Rossby waves. Okay. And for this reason, those are called topographic Rossby waves, and those are belt waves. And then what you see is that for a particular value of f, and it's easy to, to find them analytically, there will be degeneracy C point, but that correspond to twofold degeneracy point. And what happens in here? We have we had strong symmetries, uh, strong symmetries because uh, you time reversal symmetry, mirror symmetry, and you have this threefold uh, bond touching point, and then you break uh, two symmetry together, and you lifted this degeneracy point into into two degeneracy points. So you should see those two degeneracy points when beta equal f as uh, the lifting of the degeneracy of these three bond degeneracy points. And actually, that's how I came to, to, to work on this model. This is a sense to a remark from Frederick uh, Faure, who said that in this model, there were too much symmetries, and it was a non-generic case, the Matsuno case, because usually in any wave system, when you have uh, broken your symmetries, we should expect two bond touching points. Yeah, exactly. You, you get it. Yes, exactly. I uh, I told you last time that uh, uh, it is expected that whatever two bond degeneracy point you get in the generic case, the Chan number is one or minus one. And indeed, uh, this is the case here. And when you put them together, you can you, you find two and minus two. So now we want to use uh, this information. We have degeneracy point when beta f, when beta equal f. So if I am in the northern hemisphere, I'm looking at this degeneracy point here. So I have an interface. And this time, this interface is not at the equator. It's at the value of beta t equal f, because here or here, I have a gap system there or there. And in between, if I travel along this line, there is a critical value where the bonds touch each other. And if we apply what we say last time, we expect that close to the degeneracy point here, we should observe some spectral flow. So let's do it. So let's draw first a projection. Of, uh, I, I, I will plot the same figure 
as this one by projected all the k every k x is k for me here and k y is l and I project all the value of l and it looks like something like this. I exaggerate a bit. We get the degeneracy pi omega. Get one here and one here. And now what we expect from the previous analysis, so this is at the bound degeneracy point, is that if I have a profile of a beta that grows to this particular value, I will have a bond like this, a bond like that, like this, like this. And then here is the point where there is the degeneracy point. And uh, we expect so beta is decreasing. So the channel number to this associated with this point for this wave band is uh, minus one plus one for this wave band is uh, minus one plus one because beta is decreasing. The spectral flow is the opposite. Remember last lecture. So I expect one wave mode like this. Wave one mo wave mode like that. This is the spectral flow associated with this point and this point. And now the number of nodes must be conserved when you vary the parameter here. For instance, a way to see it is if the spectrum is discrete. Uh, this is a self adjoint operator. So we have a basis of eigenmode given by uh, the all uh, given by all the eigenmode of a system for a given value of k. So you cannot suddenly destroy this wave range. You need to connect them. So this is what we do here. We connect them. And by this way, we expect a wave like this. And now that we have this, we have a system. Maybe it will be discrete, maybe not. I don't know. It depends on the profile. There, the only important point is this wave branch. And now you can take the limit where uh, this uh, exponential profile is quite sharp. So this will bring the, this point close to the cost. And uh, in this limit, those uh, topographic cross B wave bands will flatten out. And you will recover the Kelvin wave problem uh, with a sharp interface in this limit. Uh, I will not spend this is was just to emphasize the analogy between Haldane model who mapped a phase diagram with two parameters one that breaks time reversal symmetry in the system, one that breaks inversion mirror symmetry uh, in uh, the system. And there are different chair numbers. Uh, in this case, for the bulk problem, uh, one minus one, zero. And what I wanted to emphasize is that the coastal wave problem is similar if you zoom here, there. So forget about the whole rows. Uh, just look at plus one, minus one, zero here. It's the same that this phase diagram with F, the term of cell symmetry breaking parameter and beta, the mirror symmetry breaking parameter. The rows are to emphasize a difference with Alden model. Here, you have a, a chain number that is defined uh, for a given value of the parameter. I really stress the last lecture that in those continuous split case, uh, you need to enclose a parameter to have a chain number in your case. And so the, the rows is to give a meaning to those numbers, zero and minus one. It means that if you go from this region to this one, you have a chain number of minus one. From this region to this one, you have a chain number of plus one. And this is what allows you to say that there is an equivalent number to this chain number that is plus one. Okay, just keep in mind that there is an analogy with respect to symmetries. In uh, actually, I, 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 I don't know exactly the, the, I think what, what was very important in this paper uh, for the Nobel Prize was the understanding of. Uh, the key uh, importance of the time reversal symmetry breaking parameter, because before this, for the quantized all effect, uh, Landau levels were thought to be essential. And there I say we could have a, 
quantizer effect with, uh, without Landau level and without magnetic fields, just by something else that uh, uh, breaks time reversal symmetry. And then he play a very important role to the development of topological insulator, this way of thinking of seeing the problem. And uh, so, yes, probably uh, this paper was essential. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, I should say also that uh, simultaneously uh, to this paper, there is another paper by um, uh, Volovic uh, on Helium 3 that uh, uh, play a very important role uh, and that is directly linked to those kind of uh, problems because he, he, he draw, there is a book uh, uh, that he wrote where uh, this, those papers from the 80s are presented and for Helium 3 where those kind of uh, phase diagram uh, are drawn. So you find similar wave excitation in uh, Helium 3 phase uh, a, uh, then coastal Kelvin weight, and with the understanding that it has also a topological origin. Yes? I'm a little bit confused. So it's based on this argument, it seems that the roughness of the coast is very important in order to have these topological weights. Right? You, you, have, you have to do some roughness to do some Okay. Yes, here uh, I draw something rough uh, because I could deform this profile and this would not change the result. But actually when I draw this profile of beta, I took an exponential uh, profile very smooth for H. Right, right. So I guess the point is that there's, there's some limit you're taking to smooth it out, right? And this is something, it yes. seems like okay. some particular limit. Yes. But I guess in like normal topological insulator type considerations, you don't have to do that. I agree. Yes. In that particular case, this is essential. And this is a key, I wanted to emphasize here, here. It is a key difference, as you say, for topological insulator, you take one material here, one material here, trivial topological, you stack them, and uh, you look at the difference of chair number and you know the number of states. We cannot do this here. Because uh, if I take my system here, my value of beta is prescribed and F, and I have no chair number at hand. It's because in those systems, there is a lattice. Because of the lattice, uh, there is a, you can build a Brillouin zone. So you have a torus. And uh, on this uh, torus, you can define a chair. You have a closed surface, naturally, for your system with a given value of parameter. With K, L varying, you can get to. Uh, let me just draw uh, for those. We have something like this with a K L. So K is periodic, L is periodic. Then you have a closed surface. Then you can look at the eigenmode on this closed surface. And this is very convenient. And then you can just with those wave numbers, uh, characterize a material, another one, stack them together. And in this context, there is the bulk boundary correspondence. And that's why I insisted that for fluids or continuous media, we don't have this bulk boundary correspondence, at least for those situations I presented. We just have, is different, a bulk interface correspondence, where the correspondence is between a PDE with spatially varying coefficient that defines some interface along a critical value. And uh, you study a bulk problem uh, related uh, to it. And then you define a chain number uh, by varying the, the parameter. This is really important uh, to appreciate this uh, difference to apply the tools. And it took a while for us actually to understand. Uh, so, that is it. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, illustrate again uh, what we can say with, uh, in this case with those tools. So, this is the case I just presented. So I would like to discuss a case that is a bit artificial because I want to stack a thin layer of shallow water, like a close, uh, uh, like a swamp, uh, with the abyss. And the abyss uh, are not very uh, well described by, uh, would not be well described by a shallow water model because I really want that the bottom uh, of the ocean uh, diverge, just to have this profile of beta with this, the critical value that is crossed in the other direction. This is artificial, but you can still do it in your model. 
uh, and check that uh, the result corresponds to your expectation with the bulk interface correspondence. And then another um, case that is destructive, and this is uh, relevant for the ocean, it is an escarpment where you do not go uh, to infinite depths, but there is some finite depths. So you stack together two oceans with different depths. And in between, there is an escarpment where you may cross or may not cross a degeneracy point in one direction and the other direction. So remember about the doubly periodic equator. This was topologically trivial, but we say that when the trapping length scale is smaller than the distance between the two equators, so here the distance between the, the so this is y direction, uh, between the two points where the critical line is close, is crossed. When this distance is larger than the trapping length scale, we can treat separately those two points to understand the spectrum. And so, okay, in the first case, at least in the limit where this is sharp enough to get this spectrum, when this is not sharp, the results still work, but the spectrum is a bit more messy, a bit messier. It's more complicated than this. You have, uh, okay, I do not go into those details. But this case is interesting because it's the, uh, it's the opposite case, okay, uh, beta increase from zero to infinity. So according to the bulk interface correspondence, I expect a spectral flow in the other direction. And this is exactly what happens. You have some topographic Rossby waves, Poincaré waves, and on the top, and you have web mode that leave, leave this band to go there. And this is equivalent of uh, the Yanai wave for the equator. In this direction, and you can check that the spectral flow is, the, is in the other direction. Take a line of frequency, you will, you will see that there will uh, be a one more mode that go on the left and on the right. And it is the opposite direction of this case because the sign of beta is different when you cross the degeneracy point. And the last example is interesting because you can use your knowledge of those two cases. This escarpment is a kind of concatenation between this case uh, here and this case here. And then you look at the spectrum and you see that it is topologically trivial. There is a gap. This is expected because uh, you cross the singularity in one direction then in the other. But still, topology allows you to interpret the spectrum in the sense that uh, these waves, which is known and called the double Kelvin waves, which is trapped along uh, this escarpment. It has a shape that uh, correspond to uh, the fact that you mixed uh, Kelvin waves with a topographic Yanai wave. So at large wave number is topographic Yanai, a small wave number is Kelvin. So there is some kind of hybridization between those two waves, such that at the end you get something topology trivial as expected from this profile. This was just to illustrate the fact that uh, with this uh, analysis, once you get the bulk problem, okay, you are not able to say uh, uh, explicit results on the spectrum. Why is there uh, those waves? Uh, the shape of this wave I could not have predicted a priori, but you are able to interpret qualitatively those results and say that if you have an analytical result in one case, for example, the exponential case here, those global uh, properties will remain valid for a large class of models. So I'm done with um, Costal Kevin Wise. Any question on this part? Yes. No, 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 no. This, this transformation, uh, once you get the recipe, you can apply it to uh, all the problems. For, for instance, uh, you can apply it to the equatorial wave problem. It's just that we do not even need this case, just this case and those two expressions. So it is too much a complex transformation for this problem. because This is rather simple. But uh, whenever the, the problem with a continuous, uh, in continuous media, you can apply it. Uh, yes, the problem needs to be initially Hermitian. 
So it looks non-Hermitian because of this, but uh, actually, uh, even without relation to Weil, uh, Wigner Weil transform, you can check that, uh, the inter uh, the, that this operator is, um, it looks non-Hermitian because when we are used to matrix, we say this is not a Hermitian matrix, but be careful, there are operators and to show Hermeticity, you will integrate by part and uh, these operators will eat this one at some point. And, uh, and so this operator is Hermitian. The, but related to your question, uh, the important point um, was this transformation here. Uh, because if you are Hermitian in those kind of continuous problems, you need to say uh, with which norm you are Hermitian. And this can be tricky for a flow problem uh, to find a good norm. For, for those flow problems, no, because uh, we linearized around the uh, base state. We know energy is conserved. This, all the, this is encoded in the field problem, but more, for more complex problem where you derive your model, there were a mean flow or something, it can be trickier. It can be possible to find in some sub cases a norm. And then uh, for this norm, you have an Hermitian operator, but for another norm, it could not be Hermitian. So this can be really tricky. Yes, yes. So in that case, it's not difficult because this is related to energy. Uh, in the general case, it's probably difficult. Yes, uh, not that I know. Yes. Uh, it allows you to, to describe locally plane wave solution, but if you take a constant, it's not, Yes. Uh, not exactly. No, no, no. The way it was uh, derived is uh, you take uh, this, uh, what well, it should a bit magical like this, but uh, the way it, I put it actually, uh, if you're interested to uh, know more about this, uh, I put an, an appendix in my note where I detail some properties of the transform and also uh, I propose an interpretation uh, that is known, uh, but how. How it is, how it was uh, derived. You take the symbol because that was the classical Newtonian structure. Take the Fourier transform, but for both variables y and uh, l, and then you take the uh, inverse Fourier transform of this, but instead uh, of uh, taking directly the inverse to Fourier transform, the y, the momentum uh, coordinate of the inverse. For a transform, you replace it, replace it in the exponential by dy. And this is how it was done. And uh, then you have product of exponential that are not the same as the exponential of the product. When you have operators, a formula for this, and different you choice for the, uh, either you make product of exponential and then you replace L by dy, or you keep the product in the exponential and you put dy and you have different quantification. And this is one of them. Here, there is no assumption, uh, but uh, on the uh, on the symbol, you should respect some. Uh, it should be smooth enough, and yeah, then the uh, mathematician uh, have a restriction on the class of symbol and class of operator. Also, you, I should stress uh, that those operators that you get from the symbol, they are pseudo differential operator, because you can have something like uh, one over the square root of uh, uh, the two times y derivative. So those are pseudo differential, but you can think of it, uh, then you make a, an expansion of uh, uh, dyy small and you recover a differential operator. This is the physicist way of doing it. <laughs> yes. So yes, that, that's a good point about the trap mode because I didn't say anything. So there is, okay, in the previous lecture, the, there were the trap mode at the equator and this was the critical line. So here we expect that the mode is trapped here. And when this point will go to zero, it will trap here. So there is a trapping length scale that will be given by your characteristic length scale of the domain 
which uh, in that case, uh, where you have a flat, uh, sharp profile, which is, uh, again, uh, the Rossby radius of deformation C over F. So this is a general rule. This term, uh, okay, I did put this a bit under the, the rug, uh, that this Kelvin wave problem uh, has an issue uh, with the fact that you are diverged here at the coast. And in the sense that uh, uh, so far I presented case where your parameter is varying uh, at infinity from minus infinity to plus infinity in y direction. Here we are bounded. Okay, but still you are bounded, but still you get the interface and the trapping length scale. And to answer your question, if I take another profile of beta t like this, then uh, I'm still bounded, but uh, there will be no trap knot because uh, I do not cross this point where beta equal f. Yeah, we only have a trap node if the spatially varying parameter cross the critical point uh, that is associated for the bulk problem with bound degeneracy point. And if we cross this number with node that there will be a wave mode that fills the frequency gap and that is trapped around this region. But this, this case is uh, interesting because physically this is the coastal waves. But it's a more, more difficult than uh, other situation where the parameter varies uh, uh, in the whole plane. Yes. 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 Yes, that's the point. And uh, I mentioned the exponential case because there are analytical results by Ball uh, in the 60s on this is sol solvable. It is complicated, but solvable. Uh, and, uh, and, but this could be much more general because the point is that whatever profile you take, you, because it has to be infinite here at the cost and because it has to be zero here uh, at, uh, when if you have a finite depth ocean, you know that you will cross this point. So this is, uh, I didn't stress this, but um, uh, for a generic uh, coastal profile, in that case, if uh, you assume that the coast is where h equals zero with finite uh, slope, and uh, you have a finite depth meter, then you know that you will cross the degeneracy point. So you must have the unidirectional mode if f is non-zero. If f is zero, you don't have it because... Uh, Uh, I will interpret it uh, as a limiting case. I wouldn't say, uh, I would say we recover for a finite value of chi, not for, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's a bit singular because if, if I show you this spectrum for a very large value of k, because I want to take a smooth profile here, at some point uh, I will see the difference with the coastal problem. So for finite value, of k, yes, the limit of the exponential uh, that is infinitely sharp uh, yields to the same spectrum of this one in that sense. But you will have different, for a given a profile, you have difference at higher, sufficiently large k. Yes. I don't know. I know. That I know the double Kelvin waves uh, were observed in experiment. Uh, I don't do not. It is in the sixties and the seventies. I do not remember. It was predicted by Longe Higgins, I, I think, and uh, then uh, who observed it? Maybe is also on the experimental paper. So it's observed, but in the ocean, I don't know. But, uh, Yes. I hear about the rest be right, but not. Yeah. 
Okay. I think the question is uh, here so far, we only saw a problem with uh, variation in y direction, while in the ocean, there are interesting problems and in atmosphere where parameters vary in two directions. And uh, that's a good question. Uh, so far, uh, all we have done uh, is with a parameter varying in one uh, direction. And uh, in some cases, when variation is smooth uh, in the other direction, you can uh, actually map the problem uh, into an external parameter that you vary, the smooth variation of the background. Uh, and uh, we tried something along this line, but in the general case, uh, the answer is, uh, I don't know, but it's clearly uh, an interesting uh, question to, that has to be taken. So I will just uh, flash uh, what I wanted to say in the third lecture. <laughs> So uh, it's a <laughs> it's a it's a recent work, and uh, actually I just submitted to Cypress. So I don't know if you know this journal, but uh, you can comment uh, yourself. So if you read it and uh, uh, you have comments, you can uh, you can be a reviewer on your own, really, <laughs> on uh, on the paper. So uh, please look at it <laughs> because I won't have time to present it. But I want to give you the idea and. Uh, the idea is that um, this is Matsuno spectrum. And uh, the idea is to provide uh, an interpretation on, oh, it's a bit magical that uh, you get this topological number, this spectral number here. And um, one way to, inter to interpret the spectral flow, if you accept the idea that you conserve the number of modes uh, when you are varying k, is to say, let's look at large value of k, small value of k, and then you have separated wave bands in gray. And uh, understanding the spectral flow is understanding why there are two more modes for this gray uh, part here uh, above and two less modes in this gray part here. And you can take uh, advantage of this limit. You have uh, the external parameter here, the wave number uh, in the meridional direction that is large. So one over this is small. And this is, you can take advantage of this small number to make asymptotic expansion. And uh, this is like a semi-classical parameter. So here, the semi-classical parameters that which allow, allows you to, to find information on the spectrum will be one over this parameter. And you want to find in the semi-classical regime to compare the number of modes above on the right to the number of modes above on the left. And for this, you know how to do ray tracing. You have a scalar equation. You use a traditional WKB approximation. And so, but we need to, to know what is the scalar operator that allows you, and can I find it for those different gray parts in limiting case? Because initially we have a vectorial operator and we want to project the dynamics on a scalar equation from which we know how to do ray tracing. And this is what we did. So to find those, Scalar operators that are actually pseudo differential operators because you find them with those kind of tools. And when you do this, you apply, you do ray tracing. So you fix, so K is large. And uh, at the beginning of the lecture, I insisted on the fact that you have say space with uh, F, which is the equivalent of Y. Uh, the conjugate coordinate L and K does vary. So we'll do ray tracing in phase space. You have wave packets. You look at their trajectory like this. This is just ray tracing. And then you ask among those rays, which are those rays that correspond to eigenmodes of the, of the operator? And for this, you need to, to make sure that the, the ray, they go along the trajectory and their phase change. And you pick up some phase when you did a full term and the eigenmode of the spectrum are those modes where the phase is the multiple of two pi, an integer multiple of two pi. So this is Borsomer field condition, and you can do this in this problem. The only difference is that when you do this, because you started from a vectorial problem multi-component when you project into it, into the quantization relation, the Borsomer field, there is something that will appear, and this something, so this is parameter space, L, F, K, this is the degeneracy point. This is ray trajectory for a given value of K. And you have the quantization relation 
bar summer field condition that will feature uh, an additional term that is the flux of the Berry curvature that he introduced last lecture in the area covered by the, the trajectory. And this flux, when you take the limit uh, for a given value of one over epsilon of uh, a large radius of the trajectory, you compute this flux is two pi here, minus two pi here. And the difference of this is four pi. It is just the shear number because there will be no contribution from here. And so within the quantification relation, you have one phase space here for the scalar operator. So look at this one, omega minus, omega plus here. They are the scalar operator for this and this. And by quantifying, you will find that there is two more nodes on the on this one, by, on this one, and the mismatch is due to the flux of very curvature that appears within the quantification condition. And by this way, we see how the shear number here that generates the very curvature appears uh, in the spectral property of the problem in two limiting cases. And then, uh, if you uh, agree that uh, you, the number of nodes are conserved, you get the spectral flow out of it. So let's just finish the, with Foucault experiment. There is a link between this and this. And actually, if you go out, I don't know if you see it, we see uh, outside the Foucault experiment along the physics building. Uh, look at it, it's working. <laughs> it's in a glass, it's in the street. Uh, and the, this mismatch of uh, two pi here and for arbitrary trajectory for the real number, it's a bit like the mismatch of uh, the angle of the uh, direction of rotation of the Foucault uh, pendulum when uh, you are not uh, at uh, the equator. And this is a geometric phase. Uh, it's a bit fast, but I will stop here. Up, I didn't have time to present this. I will just wrap up uh, about uh, all these um, lecture on topological waves. So keep in mind that across all scale, they are topological waves. So this, I took this picture from uh, the paper Brad was mentioning about active matter. It's actually a work based on a Turner two uh, equation where they found topological waves in active matter system. And uh, there are probably many other examples. And the important concept uh, I would like you to take out is uh, the churn number that uh, it's possible to compute by integrating a Berry curvature, that it's possible to compute by having the polarization relation. And uh, the key message of the lecture is that just don't look uh, only at the dispersion relation of the problem, but also at the polarization relation because you can learn a lot out of it. Okay, uh, I think that's it. Thanks. Uh, see, it's not because I have a boundary, because I could have a problem without boundary, with a varying parameter. It's because I have spatially varying parameter. And so uh, uh, the, if I decompose on Fourier transform, I will have an infinite uh, number of uh, components. Uh, so I, can, I, cannot, uh, I cannot do this. The, the problem is really because I multiply a derivative with something that is spatially varying. And I need to make a choice when I define the bug problem. Should I replace the derivative by a wave number? Should I replace it, put the derivative uh, in front of C, derive C, and then put, you have different choice. And uh, one way to do this choice without ambiguity is to make, to use this tool. And uh, a last remark, uh, is, it's uh, detailed in uh, my lecture note, and if you have a, uh, Feedback on the lecture notes will be uh, useful for me. So give it, uh, please. There's something about the curve. Uh, so yes, yeah, the question is, can we find uh, new waves or new? So the first answer is uh, the way that you can classify different possible behavior. 
And uh, finding new way, we tried uh, for the oceans. Uh, we had some idea, but the parameter was not relevant for the ocean. But then uh, currently we are working on uh, application to astero seismology, uh, where we colleagues in Lyon, where we think uh, Guillaume Lev and Armand Leclerc, where uh, we actually have shown that in a, it's possible to classify different stars depending on the stratification within the star, and to say that there could be a different kind of oscillation in those two classes of stars. So we hope it could be useful for helio seismology. And, on, and uh, there are also applications in plasma, and then uh, Brad would be uh, more competent than me to, to, to speak about those applications in plasma. I also wanted maybe to summarize a bit in the wild platform, but it was wrong. So uh, we had this problem where we assumed that uh, this function is fixed, like the first time. And then, uh, but we wanted to go to the bound problem, so we did it as a spatially dependent one. And then the idea is that uh, if you go to the bound problem in the right way, it kind of doesn't matter too much with how exactly this dependence looks, but in principle, we could have derived really differential equations with the assumption that the Poisson line is spatially dependent, and we have not a real physical equation for that, of course. But the idea is that the bulk equation, if we go to the wild transform, is good enough. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, it's good enough, and it's simple because it's, it gives you a matrix problem to, to solve. From the initial, and that's that's the point. Yes, agree. Okay, but thank you.